Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is a joy to be here with you today in Flint, Michigan. This is my first time in Flint, and I am loving it. I'm excited to share with you about Life in a Jar, the Arena Sendler Project, a high school history project that changed my life. So in 1999, I was a freshman at Uniontown High School in Uniontown, Kansas, a small rural school in southeast Kansas, all white, Protestant, absolutely no diversity in the high school. Uh, 120 students in the high school, but we had an amazing high school history teacher named Norm Kennard, and he wanted to bring diversity into our classroom by taking the stories of unsung heroes, doing in-depth research, and putting together documentaries, performances, exhibits, websites, an amazing avenue to bring uh, an opportunity to teach respect and understanding for all people regardless of race, religion, and creed. So I, along with two other students, joined and we decided we wanted to write a group performance and we wanted to learn more about the Holocaust. So we asked our teacher, do you have any ideas? And Mr. Kennard gave us a box of clippings, newspapers, magazine articles that he gathered throughout the years. And we found a 1994 News and World Report article entitled Other Schindlers featured eight rescuer stories, and one of the paragraphs said Ivana Sindlerova saved over 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust. Our immediate thought was 2,500. This has to be a typographical error, because if she saved twice as many plus what Oscar Schindler did, and she's a female, why haven't we heard her story? Surely they meant 250. So we asked Mr. Kennard, have you heard of her? Well, he hadn't. He suggested we do a Google search, one website, one result, that was it, confirming she saved the 2,500 children. Today, earlier this week, I Googled her name and over 400,000 results popped up. So when you Google, depending upon the day, sometimes there's over six to 800,000 results now sharing Irina Sendler's story. So life in a jar, we started researching. We went to the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. We went to the Kansas State Historical Society. We went to university libraries. Nothing in English about this woman. So per Mr. Kennard's suggestion, we start researching the Warsaw Ghetto, other rescuer stories, Poland, World War II, the Holocaust, to write our performance. Well, by this time, we're searching for her burial site because she would be 90 years old now, and there's no way she's still alive. We know the Nazis fractured her legs and feet, trying to get her to tell them where the jars were, but she refused. So after the war, they rebroke her legs and feet to try and set them properly. No way she could still be alive, but we got an email telling us she's still alive. She lives in Warsaw. So immediately we wrote a letter, we sent a copy of our script, pictures of us, money for her to send a letter back to us. And we started thinking as we took it down to the post office in our town of 300 people, why is a woman in Eastern Europe going to care about kids in rural Kansas? So I'll never forget the day when Elizabeth came running down the hallway shouting, we got a letter. We're so excited. There's one hallway in Uniontown High School, so it didn't take us long to get to Mr. Kennard's classroom. And we rip open the letter. We're so excited to hear from our hero. And we pull it out, and it's all in Polish. <laughs> we found a translator at the University of Kansas. And the very first line said, to my dear and beloved girls, very close to my heart, she started sharing with us how she saved these children, why she saved these children. She also told us she had nightmares every single night of her life. She continued to ask herself, did I do enough? Could I have done more? She told us that she used around 2,500 different ways to save these children. She was a social worker, pretty high up in the social welfare department in Warsaw. So she had papers stating she was a nurse. She had 25 collaborators, 24 women, one man working with her, all had false papers to have access to go in and out of the ghetto. So she's walking out almost daily, not even five feet tall, when at any moment, if she's caught helping a Jewish child, a Jewish person, she's shot immediately, no questions asked. So she goes into the ghetto, she finds children, she talks to their parents, their grandparents, the rabbi, trying to convince them to let, them take, to let her take them. And they said, give us a guarantee. She said, I can't give you a guarantee. The only guarantee I have for you is Treblinka, the Nazi death camp. 
So she would bring children out through the courthouse. The front entrance in the courthouse was in the ghetto. The back was on the Aryan side. The ghetto wall, the ghetto line went right through the middle of the courthouse. She would walk a child through. Same thing with the Catholic Church. One entrance was in the ghetto, one was on the Aryan side. She dressed the little boys as girls, dyed the little girl's hair blonde, trying to disguise them, teach them a Polish prayer. So if they were stopped, once on the Aryan side, they could speak Polish instead of Yiddish. Once they were out, she would hide them in Polish homes, orphanages, convents. But then she would write down their Jewish names, their Jewish parents' names, their new Christian names, their age and where they were placed on transparent slips of paper, which she put into jars and buried under an apple tree right across the street from the German barracks. The whole time it was under their nose and the Nazis never found out. Her goal in this whole process was to reunite the children with their family members. Parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, that was her goal. Her father taught her at a young age, if you see someone drowning, you have to jump in and save them, whether you can swim or not. She felt the Jewish religion as a whole was drowning, and it was up to her to jump in and save them. I love this quote. It's something I try and live my life by. So Life in a Jar, our project, it took on a life of its own. We participated in the National History Day competition at the district, state, and national level. And we, we were done performing. We were still writing Irina, keeping in touch. And we started getting requests for performances. So we agreed. We went to Kansas City. We did a performance at a middle school. A Jewish businessman decided to teach history one year. Happened to be that year. He's there. He's watching all of our performances. He takes us to lunch afterward. And he said, what is your goal with this project? Well, we'd love to meet Irina. And he said, OK, what are you doing to make that happen? Well, we're selling candy bars. We're sophomores in high school. And he said, OK, how much money have you raised? $81. He said, that's not going to get you very far. If I raise the money, will you go to Poland? We said, yeah. He said, OK, I'm going to raise the money. You're going to go to Poland. You say you make documentaries now. You're going to make a little documentary about what you learn, and you're going to perform for my synagogue on September 12, 2001. OK, so we're driving back to Uniontown High School, about an hour south of Kansas City. And we're thinking, we don't know this man. He's not going to call. He's not going to raise the money. Within 24 hours, he called Norm Kennard's classroom, my high school history teacher, and he said, I've got the money. You're going to Poland. This was really special for me because in 2001, my mom was in remission from her breast cancer that was diagnosed about a month after the project started in 1999. So my mom got to go to Poland with me. And people say, in the last 15 years, what is the most memorable moment for you? That's easy. Meeting Irina for the very first time, you can see the photo here. We sat around her. She talked to us. She told us stories. She had her notes written out. I remember looking into her eyes, the eyes that looked into so many parents' eyes, children's eyes, and then looking over my shoulder and seeing my mom, the two strongest, most influential women in my life, right there in the same room together, my heroes. I wanted to share a little bit about Irina's children. Uh, the left photo you see is Renata Zeidman. She's standing there with my brother. He was in the performance. Renata was 13 years old, living in the sewers when she was rescued by Irina Sendler. On the right, you see Elspieta Pisowska. Elspieta is standing with Elizabeth Cambers Hutton. She's also one of the founders of Life in a Jar. Elspieta was sedated at five months old, placed in a carpenter's box to be driven out of the ghetto in a hygiene truck. Before she was driven out, her parents said, wait, we want to put a silver spoon in the box with her. So she always knows her first name and her date of birth. Elzbieta's parents, like most of the parents' family members, were killed at Treblinka. She was never reunited with them. She's never seen a photo of them, but she continues to search. She does have her silver spoon. May 12, 2008, nine days after this photo of Irina Sendler was taken, May 3rd was the last time that we saw her. May 12th is the day she passed away. That day is also important to me because it's my birthday. I've played Irina now in the performance for about nine years. After my mother passed away from the cancer in 2006, Irina was very much like a surrogate mother to my brother and myself. 
When she passed on my birthday, it was as, as if she was passing the torch on to us to keep her light burning. Life in a jar, I've made five trips to Poland, four while Irina was alive, one after she passed away. We've done over 340 performances around the world. We continue to perform. This fall we'll be in Philadelphia and Nova Scotia sharing our project. IrinaSindler.org is our website. We've had over 50 million hits now. Visit our website, learn more about Irina Sindler. We now have the Irina Sindler Award in Poland, which is the top teaching award in Poland given to a teacher who best teaches Holocaust education in the true spirit of Irina Sindler. So our goal has been to make her story known. We have done this through our book. It tells our story, how we found Irina, Irina's story more in depth, and the Hallmark Hall of Fame movie, The Courageous Heart of Irina Sindler, is now available as well. They're both available on our website. Uh, I brought 28 books with me to, today. That's all I have. But I'd be glad to sign any of them if you're one of the lucky 28. So this school project has totally changed my life. My dream became the dream... Let me rephrase this. The dream of my high school history teacher, Norm Kennard, became, his dream became my dream. Our dream was to start a center, a foundation, a nonprofit where we could work with teachers and students around the world, teaching them how to create projects like Life in a Jar. Well, we now have that nonprofit foundation, and it is the Lowell Milken Center for Unsung Heroes located in Southeast Kansas. We work with teachers and students around the world, teaching them how to do this. We've had project in all, projects in all 50 states, 27 countries. We've worked with over 7,000 schools, 1 million students since we opened our doors in 2007. The idea of taking an unsung hero, doing in-depth research, creating performances, documentaries, exhibits, websites, sharing these role models is a passion and it, it ignites a fire inside of these students. We also bring national award-winning teachers to Fort Scott to spend time learning how to create these types of projects, and then they go back into their classrooms the following year to collaborate. Gene Shoemaker is an unsung hero real quickly. He's the father of astrogeology. He discovered the origin of Meteor Crater in Arizona. He and his wife, Carolyn, and David Levy discovered Shoemaker-Levy Comet. He was supposed to be the first scientist on the moon, but he had Addison's disease, so he was unable to go to the moon. He was killed in a, plane cra or a car crash in 1997. So to honor him, NASA sent his ashes in a lunar space probe. So we call this project Ashes on the Moon. <coughs> you can find out more about the Lowell Milken Center, Life in a Jar, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, on our websites. I want to leave you with one thought. My high school history teacher, Norm Kennard, who's now the executive director at the Lowell Milken Center, he says, young people, this is for all the young people here today, you have the ability to reach over the walls of bias and prejudices that adults can never attempt to reach. Do not carry that ability lightly. Take hold and make a change. Thank you. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.